So let's get started. So let's start our webinar. Uh, so welcome to TinyML Talks. And the topic of today's webinar is lightweight neural network architectures. Our today's speaker is Andrei Poluhin, machine learning engineer from Data Science UA from Kyiv, Ukraine. Thanks everyone for joining. We have a lot of registrations today and seems like we are about close to 100 participants now. Okay, so first of all, uh, I want to say big, big thanks to TinyML strategic partners uh, for committing to take TinyML to the next level. And uh, thanks a lot to the companies AIZIP, Analog Devices, AON Devices, Arduino, ARM, DeepLight, Edge Impulse, Photohub, GreenWaves Technologies, Gruits Incorporated, IBM, Imagimob, Itemris, ClickaTech, Microsoft, Note AI, NXP, OctoML, Prophecy, Kixo, Qualcomm, Rixen, Renaissance, SAP, Schneider Electric, SenseML, Silicon Labs, Sony Semiconductor Solutions Corporation, uh, ST, uh, stream Analyze, Synoptics, Sintiant, and TDK. So thanks a lot for all partners. Uh, this list is getting bigger and bigger, and thanks a lot to, to all our partners. So uh, everybody can join our growing TinyML community on Meetup or LinkedIn. You can see that there are thousands of, uh, of the team members. Uh, especially in the Meetup group, not as many people in uh, in LinkedIn. So please join our groups. Just scan the barcodes and uh, jo join the Meetup and LinkedIn groups. Uh, uh, we have our YouTube uh, channel, uh, and this video will be uploaded to 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 the YouTube channel as well. Uh, within a couple of days, I believe. And uh, you can find a lot of materials from all our previous events. And you, you, there is already more than 500 of different videos on, on the YouTube channel. So there will be uh, the next event in the Tiny Melon Trailblazer series. Uh, there will be the event with co-founder of CEO of uh, Prophecy uh, on January 25th at 7.30 a.m. PDT. And uh, you can you can uh, uh, register now. So this event is uh, with Luca Vera. I hope I pronounced everything correctly. If not, pardon me, please. Um, also, we'll have a big, big event, uh, the Tiny ML Summit, which will be held in uh, in there in High Regency San Francisco Airport uh, on March 27th, 29th. So, we'll, there will be a summit, an exhibition, and research sym symposium. So, everything, everything here. So, it's a, it's really a premier annual gathering of senior level uh, technical experts, and uh, you know the call for papers is open uh, you can you can apply for the sponsorships and you can also contact uh, everyone uh, with the with the emails uh, from this slide uh, on June 26 28 there will be tiny email EMEA innovation forum uh, which will be in Amsterdam uh, so the event will be in, uh, held in person and uh, the call for presentations will be open will be open soon uh, there are also uh, sponsorships available so this event is a little bit more far from the current time so stay tuned and watch for the announcements in the tiny ml groups uh, so i would like to introduce the org committee of tiny ml group in ukraine so i'm oleg boguslavsky i'm the today's moderator i'm co-owner and cto of data science us we provide the software development services uh, with a specialization in the field of ai and uh, machine learning so we'll be happy to to work with uh, everyone who might be interested in these services so you can visit our website for more information and uh, our second Second member of the committee, Sergey Kashenko. He is interim CEO at Yellow. It's a very cool uh, so, crypto solution. Um, so together, this is the first webinar which we held uh, this year, and we are happy that uh, it has a lot of attention and a lot of participants. 
And now I'm happy to introduce uh, to you Andrei Paluchin, uh, our speaker. Uh, the main areas of Andrei's interest are the research of deep learning architectures and methods of training deep networks. Uh, he's interested in the, all the mathematical aspects and theorems behind it and the, in the interaction of AI with the surrounding world. Uh, he has a lot of practical experience in putting uh, the models into the, on, on the edge. So I'm, I'm confident that uh, the, today's presentation will be very, very, very interesting. And it has a huge amount of slides. Hope we'll be on time, but we'll see. So I'm passing the word to Andre, and once again, thanks everyone for joining TinyML webinars and the stay with our community. Andre, your turn now. Uh, yeah, hi all. Thank you, Oleg, for presentation. Um, I will continue. Uh, let me speak a little bit about myself. So I'm ML engineer in data science UI and Samba TV. I'm also doing uh, mentorship in Projector Institute in uh, Ukraine and also in 1011. Uh, also, I'm getting a master's degree in mathematics and I'm writing about the AI in my Telegram blog. Also, I have my personal website uh, where I also post some useful articles about the latest machine learning researches and uh, technologies. So I'm very passionate about the artificial intelligence and um, uh, today I would like to speak, speak about the lightweight neural network architectures. Uh, before we continue, um, I would like to say that uh, today there are a common practice to stack more layers and get more data and then you get the better model, but uh, our resources is limited. So for example, if you would like to put the artificial intelligence in a mobile system or edge device, device maybe a TV, so we need to reduce the size of the model. We need to optimize it. And so this is uh, how to do it. Um, the structure of this talk uh, is the following. Uh, there are uh, nine points. Uh, we will describe the problem overall, uh, then we will describe the optimization pipeline steps. Uh, and also I conducted the huge research about the modern uh, mobile architectures. I created the taxonomy of these architectures. Uh, there are mobile net, model scaling formula, neural architecture search, group convolution family, and also squeeze and excitation family. Uh, and more, there is also a VIT family. So let's start. Um, the first one is, um, one minute. I can see the title of the screen. Oh, okay. Uh, the first one is a problem statement. So the larger model produces uh, better results, but runs slower. And also smaller model produces worse results, but runs faster. So how can we make the optimal choice uh, between the size and the performance of our model? Uh, here's three main steps to optimize your machine learning model. The first one, and it is a lecture objective. The main topic of this webinar is a model selection. It is the step in your uh, development when you need to select your model. You can select mobile net, which is very popular architecture. You can select FBNet, or maybe you will go to VIT architectures that is more efficient nowadays, and so on. There are thousands of different architectures. The second step is a model optimization. You uh, could change the model architecture, like you can do pruning, you can do low rank factorization, distillation, singular value decomposition, weight clustering, so on, so on. It is about changing the model architecture. You could not change the model architecture, but anyway, optimize it with quantization, for example. Uh, you could also combine the methods above and uh, get the best results. And the last step is a non-model optimization. It is a software and hard hardware optimization. Software is about software accelerators uh, like um, DeepX, CNN, Droid, 
uh, and like it, we are talking about the machine learning framework uh, frameworks. For example, you could write the custom shaders for TensorFlow or PyTorch and so on. Uh, talking about the hardware, uh, we're talking about the microcontrollers uh, like electronics uh, that could optimize the inference of your model, maybe even training. Uh, commonly, commonly it's maybe most about the CPU device, but uh, about GPU uh, also low power. So let's start from the uh, families, deep learning architecture families. Uh, there is a mobile net family. Uh, it's mobile net v1, v2, and v3. Then we will go to the model scaling formula families. It's about efficient net and tiny net. Not everyone heard about tiny net, but tiny net is a special formula for efficient net for mobile devices. Neural architecture search is the next family. It's about the brute forcing or more intelligent search of the optimal architecture of the models. Then we will overuse the group convolution family. We, we will be talking about shuffle net, shuffle net v2, condensed net, mixed net, gloss net, and the other ones. <clears throat> uh, the next uh, family is squeeze and excitation. We will be talking about squeeze net, squeeze next, and squeeze and excitation network, the basic one. And the last one, we will shortly overuse the VIT mobile architectures. We will be talking about mobile VIT, the Apple. Uh, publication and architecture and HVAT's architecture. So let's start from the mobile net family. There are three versions of the mobile net. Mobile net architecture was developed by the Google. The first version was developed in 2017. Um, so what is special about this architecture? So the first one, the authors uh, removed the uh, common convolution operator and inserted depth-wise separable convolution. Also, they replaced ReLU with ReLU 6, and they introduced width and resolution hyperparameters that you can uh, fine-tune for your needs. Um, here is a architecture of the depth-wise separable convolution. You need to separate your common convolution operator into the two separate operators uh where one will be uh, operating in uh depth wise uh, spectre uh like width and haze and uh, the next one is point wise convolution that will connect the separate uh, features together and uh, do um element wise multiplication and sum up in the end uh also about uh replacing relu with relu 6 uh, so ReLU 6 is more op optimal for low power devices because your low power devices uh, could handle a very uh, tiny bits of information. So for ReLU 6, you only need a few bits in for information because ReLU 6 could contain the uh, values from only zero to six, no more, no less. Uh, also, speaking about hyperparameters, there are width and resolution multiplier, uh, which could uh, tune your size of the network to your uh, business needs. Uh, the next architecture is mobile net v2. It's 30% faster and 1% uh, accurate than the first version of mobile net. It's also the model from the Google. So authors replaced the nonlinear bottleneck with linear bottleneck. Uh, they invented inverted residual blocks and provided expansion projection way. Uh, here's a residual connection and inverted residual connection. So the common residual connection is uh, simply addition of the input uh, information, input features to the output features. So you could save the valuable information from the beginning and pass it to the end of your network. Inverted residual convolution is uh, a little bit more trickier. Like um, the thing is that they removed um, the non-linearity. Uh, they provide the only linear um, operation here. And uh, like some changes in passing the features through these layers. 
And here's a conception of expansion projection. Uh, the exp expansion projection works like a zip and unzip. <clears throat> so the expansion layer acts as a decompressor like unzip that first restores the data to its full form. So mapping into the high dimensional space, then the depth wise layer performs whatever, like filtering with convolutions and uh, like it's it filtering the more important features and uh, then projection layer compress the data back to the small uh, representation of your information. The next version is mobile net v3. Uh, it was invented in uh, 2019. It was two times faster than the previous version. It was 30% smaller, but maybe a little bit uh, accurate, less accurate than the previous one. So the authors um, replaced Relu 6 with hard switch that is more optimal uh, for mobile architectures. They introduced squeeze and excitation model. Um, they used MNAS-NET and NetAdapt algorithms to find the optimal number of layers and features. And they redesigned the expensive layers. Uh, speaking about the hswish function, so it's simply the multiplying of x with uh, ReLU6 uh, from x plus 3 divided by 6. It's more curative uh, function than it was before. Like here's a comparison of swish and h swish and sigmoid and h sigmoid. Um, squeeze and excitation block was invented in, in squeeze and excitation network that we will be talking later about. But the main concept is the following one. So firstly, for any given transformation F, you need to map your input X to the feature maps. Uh, and then you do convolution that will transform your data into the one times one, one uh, times number of channels. Uh, while your main feature information uh, will pass through the network. And in the end, they will uh, do multiplying uh, one element from the one by one by uh, uh, by the entire feature layer of the produced features. So it's simply feature calibration model. Uh, and here's some changes in architecture of the building block. Uh, for comparison, here's uh, V2 and V3. Um, they inserted squeeze and excitation model and also replaced uh, activation functions with uh, H function, like sigmoid with H sigmoid. So to sum up, the first version of MobileNet was 10 times faster and smaller than VGG16. The second version was a little bit faster and smaller than the previous one, and even a little bit accurate, more accurate. And the last, uh, the third version was two times faster than the second one, 30 times smaller, but a little bit uh, less accurate. Uh, I personally used mobile nets a lot in my uh, business needs, in my work, uh, because there are a lot of implementations in different frameworks of mobile nets. There are a lot of optimized, pruned, quantized, dist distilled architectures of uh, mobile nets. So we can easily uh, use it in our production systems uh, for image classification, uh, for object detection, and the other um, tasks. So it's the easiest, the basics uh, one architecture. The next interesting approach is model scaling formula family. Uh, so background, uh, what is width, depth, and resolution? Here you can see the um, pipeline of the neural network. And uh, there are some comparison of width, depth, and resolution. So as, as you can see, the depth is a number of layers in your network. The resolution is an um, input resolution of the, for example, image <clears throat> and the size of your features inside the network. 
And the width is number of features per layer. Like, for example, you have a convolution operator with 16 um, kernels or maybe 64. So it's width difference between them. And how can we find the optimal number of width, heights, and uh, width depth and resolution? So to help us with it, there are three architectures, efficient net V1, efficient net V2, and tiny net. Efficient net V1 uh, architecture was six times faster than ResNet and GPipe by Google. Uh, they invented the special model scaling formula, so they didn't guess hyperparameters. They use alpha times beta in square times gamma in square, approximately equals two. Um, so you, using this equation, you could uh, calculate your parameters. The second version of efficient net uh, was efficient net V2, and it was two times faster than the first version. Um, what was the changes? Uh, firstly, they used progressive training with, uh, instead of static training parameters. What it means, for example, when you train your image classifier, you could start from training it on 64 per 64 images. Uh, then you will increase the resolution of the input image. You will use 128 by 128. Then you will twice increase the resolution, so on, so on. So it's progressive training. You could also do, uh, do it in the opposite direction, like reduce the resolution, or you can, I don't know, do something like sinusoidal um, res resolution. So it will make your model more robust to the input images. The second uh, point is using depth-wise layers in later stages because the authors proved that depth-wise layers in early stages are not very efficient, like convolutions, but they are very efficient in later stages. So why don't we uh, just remove them in the early layers and use only in the later stages? Like we can't remove them entirely, we can reduce the number of filters, for example. And also they used fused MB convolution uh, instead of MB convolution. Fused MB convolution is uh, simply a union of the convolution one by one and depth wise convolution three by three. Also they applied neural architecture search to fine tune the hyperparameters of the architecture and scaling. And the interesting one, maybe not everyone heard about it. So it's tiny net. As uh, it was invented in 2020, tiny net was 2% uh, percent, uh, more accurate than efficient net v1. But the interesting thing is that the authors also provided the formula for hyperparameters. But this formula, formula is efficient for a uh, low number of your um, layers. Because efficient net was designed for big models, so we can scale your model bigger and bigger, but it will still be efficient. But when you will uh, try to apply efficient net formula formula for v zero, v minus one, v minus two architectures, it would not be efficient. But tiny net formula is efficient. Uh, this formula was developed by mathematical approaches based on Gaussian uh, process. So it's uh, really effective. To sum up model scaling uh, family, efficient net v1 was six times faster than ResNet. Awesome. Uh, the second version was two times faster than the first one uh, version. And the tiny net was designed specifically for mobile architectures. Until we continue, maybe it's time to make some questions. What do you think, Oleg? Uh, yeah, so if there are, I mean, I don't see any questions in the Q&A so far, so I assume that all good, but just a reminder to everyone, so if you have questions, you can post them immediately to the Q&A, and then once we'll accumulate a certain amount of questions, we'll stop and, uh, and answer the questions and then resume the presentation. So, Andrea, I assume that you can, uh, given that there are no questions as of now, there was one question which I addressed myself, but other than that, uh, you can just continue. Oh, there is one question. So uh, the question is, do you think uh, this can be run on platforms like STM32 or Raspberry Pi? 
Uh, yeah, if we, <clears throat> if we are talking about mobile net architectures, they are very popular and there are implementation for uh, ARM devices for Raspberry Pi. I personally saw the distilled versions of the Raspberry Pi that can run like 10 FPS on Raspberry Pi. Um, of course, with small resolution in input, but anyway, it, it can run, it can be run. Uh, it's about mobile net. About efficient net, it's very, it's also very popular architecture, but uh, tiny net, for example, more specific uh, one. So maybe to develop the tiny net to each device, it uh, would require uh, more uh, time to develop this architecture and train and fine tune. Uh, okay, and there is one more question. Uh, can fibrated learning be applied to these frameworks? Oh, Mm. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I don't know the I don't know the answer. Mm, sorry, <laughs> really can answer. Yeah, I think that we can just try to answer offline. Uh, there is also one question: Can it be run on Arduino? Oh, uh, maybe. Yeah, for Arduino, it's more specific platform than Raspberry Pi, so maybe it would be even more harder to find. Uh, for example, efficient net. I, I'm not sure that there are open source uh, versions of mobile net for Arduino, but um, I, I think for mobile net, there are implementations, but not for efficient net. Okay, so the next question is uh, Have you tried any of these models on Audio Moth? I don't, I'm not sure what is that. Mm, audio audio mod. Mm, sorry, can you please specify in more details what is it? Thank you. For yeah, that. yeah. Maybe you can just rephrase the question. So, uh, next question is: Can these models be quantized for optimization? Yeah, sure. Um, I saw the blog post. Uh, in the internet where the guy take, took a mobile net architecture and like did uh, really a lot of uh, quantization, like int 8 or something like this. So it was a lot of FPS with this architecture. Uh, I didn't saw quantization with efficient net, but I'm pretty sure that uh, there are uh, some ready to use efficient net architectures. Okay, thank you, Andre. Next question is, uh, uh, we are talking about Tini model to be used in the training phase or in the inference phase? Uh, we are talking specifically for inference. It's not about the training. For the training on edge devices, there are more specific uh, techniques to do it. We're talking, uh, this lecture is only about the inference of the Tiny models on the edge devices. So it's about architectures that are running fast and efficient. Okay. I think the next question is simple. I'll answer it offline. Um, are these architectures free to use and or be modified for commercial purposes or there are any licensing limitations? Um, uh, like, I work, I'm working uh, in machine learning for more than three years, but um, I, I haven't uh, seen any of the publication that describes some architectures that you could not implement uh, in the practice. Like maybe there are some architectures, but these popular architectures like mobile net and efficient net are 100% could be used in production. The only thing that you need to rewrite the code, for example, if the authors provide the original code of their research, you mostly you can could not use it in production. You need to change it. You need to rewrite it from scratch uh, by your hands. And so it will work. Okay, and uh, the last question for uh, for before uh, before Andre will, will resume the presentation. So. Um, the question is presented architectures and benchmarks are based on the problems with the image as an input. How would that translate to other domains of problems and inputs like, for instance, audio, acceleration and similar sensors? Mm -hmm. 
Interesting question. Thank you. Uh, so mobile net architecture is interesting because of the depth by separable convolution. So you can use depth by separable convolution in 1D space or in 3D space. So you can also use depth by separable convolution in audio. And speaking more about it, audio is very often represented by the um, Oh, um, if I'm not wrong, uh, spectrogram, yeah, or um, like when you do Fourier transformation. Uh, so it's basically the image, and with this image you can use uh, it at, as a 2D um, data and use these architectures. About efficient net, yeah, maybe formula of efficient net is more specific for images. Um, and I don't think that it could be applicable for audio or something other uh, okay and also i see that the question re regarding fibrated learning uh, evgeny uh, wrote that he would like to answer this question evgeny maybe you can answer that yes i think uh, federated learning typically requires quite a bit quite a bit of more memory uh, so because you need to aggregate um, deltas from uh, different devices on one so it's it's more like a training type of problem, not an inference type of problem. Uh, so that that's today. I think uh, it's hard to do federated learning on uh, on uh, microcontroller type of devices. You need to have bigger bigger devices for for training. Okay, thank you. So I think that we are done with the first portion of questions. So Andre, uh, you are welcome to continue. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Oleg. So let's continue. Uh, the next family is neural architecture search. So uh, background, what is neural architecture search? This task uh, is uh, composed from the three main uh, definitions. The first one is search space. So the search space is uh, the, the set of architectures and building blocks that we can use to build the neural network. The search strategy is a strategy that we use to find the architecture and the performance estimation strategy is how do we know that this architecture is optimal and is sufficient for our needs. So neural architecture search is a search or of optimal uh, neural architecture for your specific data with your specific restrictions, for example, the maximum amount of memory to use, the maximum battery consumption, the maximum CPU consumption and uh, temperature and so on, so on. And there are plenty of these algorithms. They, many of them constructed by evolution algorithms, many of them from genetic algorithms. Also, uh, the people, uh, people do neural optimization with this uh, algorithms. So let's start from NASNet. It's maybe the most basic algorithm to do neural architecture search. Um, NASNet, it is an algorithm that allow you to find the optimal architecture and the architecture that was found was three times faster and 4% uh, more accurate than Inception. Yes, Inception is old architecture, but we are talking about 2017 year. And for that times, it was a really good result. So authors used a NASNet cell by search space and scheduled drop pass regularization technique. Uh, NASNet search space is constructed by two basic uh, cells, normal cell and reduction cell. The only two cells that are composed in a predefined way and uh, the objective of the algorithm is to find the structure of these two cells. So we will find the optimal architecture. Uh, and um, sorry, and uh, the schedule draw pass regularization technique uh, means that as long as you do search, the more probability of the dropping of some um, evolution path of your blocks. So the longer your uh, pipeline of the um, evolution of your network, the most probability that it will be dropped. So the model will optimize the architecture. 
the next one is PNAS Net, the same year, but eight times faster and five times efficient than NAS Net. Uh, how did they do it? They use sequential model based optimization instead of reinforcement learning and evolution algorithms. So, yeah, you can do like a meta learning. You can learn the model architecture that you will teach to um, do some task. It's a more uh, newest and modern approach to find the architecture because evolution algorithms was invented a really a long time ago and uh, reinforcement learning also. Also, there is a ChamNet, uh, ChamNet uh, algorithm, not architecture. Um, it allows us to gain 8% of accuracy more than ResNet 50 with the same latency. So Hamelon is basically adaptive gen genetic algorithm where the gen uh, is a vector of hyperparameters, the number of filters in your convolution operators and um, locations of your bottlenecks. Uh, you need to define your uh, optimization strategy and then this algorithm will optimize your architecture for your data, platform, energy, uh, latency, and so on, so on. Uh, the next one is MNASNet, a very popular algorithm to do neural architecture search. In nowadays, it's, um, it produced two times faster architecture than MobileNet V2 and NASNet. Uh, the main uh, uh, the main point of this uh, publication was to minimize latency directly instead of minimize flops to reduce latency because measuring latency directly is really uh, expensive because you need to as you can see in this image you need to train your model you need to evaluate it on the mobile device measure the latency um, measure like measure the latency do them. Uh, do back propagation, optimization, and optimize your architecture. is It's really uh, very expensive uh, comparing with uh, measuring the flops. Like you need to only measure the number of operations that you need. Um, seems Andre is frozen. Uh, can somebody read in the write in the chat? Uh, did 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 you also lose Andre? Okay, sorry for sorry for that. So maybe some technical issue. So we'll be uh, let's 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 wait a few more. A few minutes here he should go okay andre is back andre is back so yeah i'm 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 very sorry there are problems with um, lightning in ukraine so uh, we do the best that we can but sometimes so can you hear me can you see the screen yes 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 everything is good so let's go ahead okay yeah so let's continue fbnet this algorithm is uh, also neural architecture search and it did uh, 420 times faster search than MNASNet. how did they do it they use differentiable neural architecture search framework so you use gradient descent optimization to optimize your architecture directly without computing uh, like latency or flops or something like that. You just compute the gradient um, relatively to latency, for example, and optimize your architecture. Um, the next one is Amoeba Net, the same year, a few times faster search than common reinforcement learning search. Instead of using reinforcement learning search, you could do aging evolution. Aging evolution means that at the early stages of the search, uh, you do 
evolution and uh, then you will not do evolution you just train your model something like this so to sum up uh, there are a lot of algorithms for neural architecture search they all different based on evolution on gradient descent on reinforcement learning um, some of them specific for convolution based network some of them for um maybe transformers uh, and so on so on uh the really cool result as i see is fbnet uh really 420 uh, x faster source than monasnet it's awesome the next family is group convolution family what is group convolution um so the basic convolution operation is using a few kernels to uh, compute the pairwise uh, multiplication of the elements and then you sum it up into the output features but what if we will not sum up all of the uh, elements in a feature like you will split your uh, elements into the groups and your convolution will perform a sum only in this group uh, it require less operations but uh, as you can uh, see it could be less efficient because you um, reduce the capacity of your network to learn the uh, connections between the elements so your accuracy could drop uh, but uh, some people invented methods that could uh, really perform even better with group convolutions or uh, at least not very uh, bad not not very worse uh, the first one is condensed net 2017 year <clears throat> uh, this architecture was two times smaller than shuffle net uh, they used weights pruning in the early stages of training only at the early stages and then they find you in the model also they used group convolution system of convolutions and the interesting thing is that they did not predefine the groups of convolutions, like three, four, five groups, but they learn this grouping automatically during the training. So they used optimal uh, grouping location between the elements. Uh, let's inspect it in more details. So here's a few condensing stages of your optimization. There are C minus one condensing stages if you uh, choose uh, the condensing factor c for example with g uh, equals three three groups and condensing factors c equals three we will do two condensing stages at the, each stage we will remove uh, one divided by c filters and at the end of this pipeline there are still will be one divided by c features remaining and then we will rearrange these features in the optimal way so there will be no like friction multiplications by zero for example when you do something like pruning it will be optimal operation for your device with very really less operations with nearly equal performance uh, on the right side, you can see the image of training loss uh, relatively to the epochs. We can clearly, uh, clearly see con three condensing stages and then uh, the increasing of the loss when we do recalibration of the features rearranging. But then the loss value really goes down. The next architecture is shuffle net V1. It was. Um, 13 times faster than AlexNet. Yeah, AlexNet is very old architecture, but anyway, uh, this research from 2017. Uh, it was uh, plus seven percent more accurate than MobileNet V1. Uh, the thing is, they used group convolution with feature shuffling. So 
Yes, you you do group convolution, so you reduce the number of operations, but you will shuffle your features connections between the uh, groups. So uh, abstractly, you uh, use all the connections, but with some gaps. So the number of operations is less, but the performance is nearly the same. Uh, here is a building block of this shuffle net architecture. It called shuffle net unit, and it looks like this. There is a, a residual connection, and there is a shuffling. Shuffling goes after the one by one con group convolution, and at the end you concatenate the. No, sorry, it's not a residual connection. It's um. It's uh yeah, it's residual. It's residual connection because. Uh, in the second version of shuffle net, it will be just split in the features. But in the first one, it's residual connection. So you concatenate the input features, you concatenate the resultant features, you perform the ReLU and output the features. And there is a second version of the shuffle net. It was 58% faster than mobile net v2 of the same year of development and 63% faster than shuffle net v1. How did they do it? They uh, used channel shuffle at the end of the block instead uh, of the beginning of the block. They used ReLU before the concatenation of these uh, features. And they split features in two groups before the convolution, the identity features and features that you will process with your operations. Uh, also, the interesting architecture is a mixed net uh, MixNet was 4% more accurate than mobile net v2. The authors used mixed convolution, and the idea is very simple. You take convol uh, convolutions of the different sizes. Uh, so instead of using 3x3 three three 10 times, you use 3x3, 5x5, 7x7, so on, so on. <clears throat> uh, and you use group convolution with it. So you reduce the number of operations. Uh, but you increase the kernel, but anyway, the flops is smaller, but the result is nearly the same as without grouping. The interesting architecture is crossnet. It's 1% more accurate than mobile net v3, but the idea is really tricky. Like you use depth-wise convolutions to produce the host features. You apply your host convolution. So uh, let's inspect it visually. So here is our input data. Then we process this data with convolutions and we have this size of features. Then for each feature, we apply the simple depth-wise convolution one time and we get the new feature map. And then we just stack these two groups of convolution um, outputs so we get twice more features with a very cheap depth-wise convolution, and it really works. It really reduces the number of operations. So without all the overheads that was invented at mobile network three, we just simply do tricky depth-wise convolution and get the same, even better results in mobile network three. The next interesting architecture is DiceNet. DiceNet was 3% more accurate than mobile net v2 and shuffle net v2. And they invented a really interesting unit, dice unit. It's called dice unit. So uh, you use three different convolutions. First convolution is performing depth wise uh, inference. The second one is width wise. And the last one is height wise. And uh, in the end, you stack these features like even not stack you do um like product like including um, to cut product something like this of these features it's not stacking <clears throat> then you process these features with convolution one by one do some residual connection uh some convolution operations average pruning and so on and so on and in the end you will achieve a really representative uh, feature vector with a very cheap operation because these three convolutions are cheaper than the only um, one big convolution because it's factorization of the convolution operation. 
Another factorization uh, architecture is Micronet. Micronet was two times smaller and three times faster than MobileNet with three. Uh, they used microfactorized group convolution. And with, uh, instead of ReLU, they used dynamic shift marks. Uh, there are a lot of materials to get into the microfactorized group convolution, but we can inspect the microfactorized depth wise convolution. So there is a factorization of the point wise and depth wise convolutions. Uh, depth wise convolution is very simple uh, factorization because you know each uh, every uh, possible matrix you could produce uh, with multiplication of two vectors. For example, for my matrix k by k, you could multiply vectors k by one and y by k. So instead of using convolution with filter k by k, you use two convolutions k by one and one by k. So it's the right image. And you really uh, reduce the number of operations a lot. Um, there were, com yeah, computational expensive. So it was O from k square c. And they reduced the number of operations to O from KC, really divided by K. So for example, if you are using convolution three by three with macro factorized group convolution, you will reduce number of operations in three times. And dynamics shift max is a special activation function for such group convolution architectures you take the maximum from the circular group shifts of the your layer so you take all the possible input uh, outputs in your grouped um grouped architecture uh, like cir circular uh, group and take the maximum of it so you will source the relevant information uh, sorry sorry <clears throat> uh to sum up uh Condensnet was 13 times faster than AlexNet. Condensnet was two times smaller than ShuffleNet. ShuffleNet V2 was even 63% faster than ShuffleNet V1. And um, Mixnet, GlossNet. So in practice, uh, I personally uh, used ShuffleNets. I used uh, Costnets and uh, Mixnet. Um, the interesting thing is that all these tricks with group convolution are very interesting mathematically and in theoretical space, but when you do all these things in practice, they really very common don't work because uh, the common three by three convolution is very optimized for the devices, specifically for GPU inference, but for CPU also. So when you try to factorize your convolution or you apply convolutions like in Mixnet 3x3, 5x5, 7x7 and more and more, these convolutions are not optimal for the inference in the modern frameworks like um, PyTorch, TensorFlow and so on. And the performance is uh, not following the theoretical uh, results. But uh, this architecture is really efficient, they're really small. So uh, you can start from them and then, then if you really need them be efficient in your device, you can rewrite the shaders, write custom CUDA kernels for those architectures, and I believe they will be very, <clears throat> very efficient. Um, okay. Uh, I can continue, like or we can... yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Andre, it's better to continue to to cover two more families of uh, of neural networks, and then we'll finalize with the Q and A session. Okay, squeezing excitation family. Squeezing excitation family based on squeezing excitation approach. There are only three architectures. So the first one is SqueezeNet. SqueezeNet use fire model. This architecture is fifty times smaller than AlexNet. Fire model is a um, um maybe early invention of the depth wise separable convolution it's not depth wise separable convolution but i think depth wise separable convolution wasn't inspired by uh squeeze net because it also consists squeeze, squeeze and expand one by one filters then three by three convolution filters but it's not depth wise separable convolution um the next architecture is squeeze next the improved version of the squeeze net 
Uh, it was the year when the mobile net v1 and v2 was publicated. So the authors knew uh, about the mobile net, depth wise separable convolutions. So they used it <laughs> and also they add residual connections. So the difference between the mobile net and squeeze next is maybe only in the architecture, but building blocks are the same. And the results are nearly the same with mobile net v1, but a little bit more faster and a lot more faster than the first version. Squeezing excitation network, the basic network uh, that was uh, that invented the squeezing excitation block that we were talking before when we talked about mobile net architectures. Uh, to sum up, I use squeezing excitation block in my architectures. This idea is simple and really efficient. It will save you uh, a lot of operations. <coughs> uh, and uh, that's all, because that's why separable convolution was invented um, before the squeeze next. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. The last family that I would like to talk about is mobile transformers. We'll talk about mobile VAT by Apple and HVATs. So mobile VAT. Mobile VAT was invented in the past, uh, in the last year, in 2022. It was 3% more accurate than mobile net with three and 6% uh, more accurate than the IT um, transformer architecture. They used mobile VAT block instead of combination of convolutions and attentions. Uh, here is a picture how does mobile VAT block works. So in the bottom line, you can see the, all the pipelines. So the input image followed by the convolution operation. Then here is a mobile net v2 block, simple mobile net v2 block with depth with separable convolutions, residual connection, inverted residual connections, and so on. So they just lowered the decreased the resolution. And in some uh, point, when the resolution is 30 two by 32, they applied mobile VAT block. And then they applied it even two times more. <clears throat> mobile VAT block is simply convolution plus VAT. Um, you just uh, unfold your features into the linear layers. You do L times of transformer. Then you fold your data. You do convolution. You do residual connection. You do convolution and by n and you output the features and then again mobile uh, net v2 block mobile via team by net v2 in the end there are there is a convolution one by one uh, global pooling and linear layer so that's simply the architecture uh, i don't think it's very like i tested it in uh, my work and it's not very fast because the idea is cool but uh, optimization of the transformers in edge devices is um, really a um, problem nowadays, I think, because um, this is a new technique. Uh, there are a lot of implementations, but um, it's not so optimal as, for example, convolutions. And uh, edge VITs, the same year, 2022, is 12% more accurate than mobile VIT. The main um, a result of this publication is local global local global local information exchange bottleneck. It includes aggregation information from the neighbor tokens with depth wise convolution, sparse delegate tokens for long range information exchange, and transposed convolutions to update information since tokens. Uh, here's a global diagram of this architecture. Um, the input features goes through the patch embeddings and then local uh, like there is four stages first second third and uh fourth one all of them are the same uh, they are just reducing the resolution of your features and here is they uh their architecture there is local aggregation sparse attention and local propagation models how does they work um the local aggregation model looks at the nearest tokens of the image when you unfold your image and it tries to learn the um, information between, between the neighbor patches but from uh, outside 
into the inside information, into the inside tokens. Global sparse attention is doing um, global attention, like it took a very long range tokens and try to learn the dependency between them. And local propagation is like an inverse to local aggregation. It learns the um, dependency of the inside features to the outside features. Uh, it really looks like a simple convolution, but uh, in context of transformers, when you unfold your data. Uh, as I said, I tried mobile VAT in my projects. Um, it's really hard to train transformer architectures. It's really hard to optimize them. Even for G GPUs, your custom transformer layers are really heavy and even more for mobile architectures. But I believe that the future is with transformer architectures and uh, we will do really, really good optimization for these layers. That's all from me. Thank you for attention. I'm open to your questions. Yeah, thanks a lot, Andre. And uh, let's go through the questions. Um, so, um i'm not sure this is the question to you so there is a question regarding the audio signal processing so audio classification and audio event detection which algorithm would you recommend for audio detection which uh, architecture would i recommend uh, yeah for uh, uh for audio classification and audio event detection uh like i think Maybe this person means about efficient architecture for audio uh, recognition. So I really recommend to use some of these architectures that I was talking about. Uh, yes, this architecture is for 2D information for images, but uh, if we are talking about the convolutions, you could anytime you can do 1D convolution, you can try to re rearrange these approaches for your audio data. And uh, I think it will perform really good. um okay uh next question is um let's start from the beginning so uh do do you have a look at morph net in order to only get a network size which is really necessary and not larger morph net mm -hmm. hmm. no i didn't hear about morph net Mm, it's really interesting. What is the year of the publication of this architecture? I will I will read about it. I think I don't okay. I don't know about. It. Okay, there is also the, the request a little bit more details about Charmnet. Maybe you can back to the slide and maybe provide a little bit more details. Charmnet. 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 Charm. Yeah. Charmnet. Mm -hmm. Charmnet. Uh, Hmm. It's a basic neural architecture search algorithm that use adaptive genetic algorithms um, where your gene that will mutate and you will find the optimal gene. So your uh, goal of optimization is your uh, hyperparameters of your uh, features. So the main idea is that it uses genetic algorithm for a uh, vector of your hyperparameters. Mm, and your evolution strategy optimize accuracy, latency, energy, and the other goals that you will possess. Okay. Thanks, Andre. Uh, we'll try to be as fast as possible because we are already out of time. and uh, Many people had to join to other meetings. So next question is, uh, NAS can be applied to any ML algorithm or only, let's say, to convolutional neural networks? NAS? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> sure. Uh, NASNet is just an approach to do neural architecture search. So you need to define two cells, normal and reduction. Of course, there is some difference between them. You could read as more details in the original paper. So 
uh, you need to define these two cells. You will locate them in specific order in your architecture, and your algorithm, NASNet, will optimize this architecture for your purposes, for audio data, for video data, for text maybe, so on, so on. Yeah, thanks, Andre. So next question is, uh... Essentially, the, you are, uh, the question is uh, whether there is some kind of a good paper which compares all these architectures in terms of accuracy, speed, weight. So, I mean, to like kind of the paper similar to your presentation, but even more in depth. So maybe you, you heard about some paper like that. Uh, yeah, I really, mm, for, uh, I looked at those papers, I read them, partially I guess the information from them because there are maybe a few surveys of the mobile device architectures, but they all look at different aspects, like for example, some papers look at the speed, some at the performance. Uh, of course, I can share these papers with you if uh, Oleg will provide some communication channel for us. Yeah, I think that the main communication channel will be Tiny ML Forum. So the, the where where the, the 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 presentation will be shared as well. So I think that that's where it will be possible to, okay. to make I will, discussion. Okay, I will share. Yeah, I will share. Okay. Um. Uh, so the next question is. Uh, when you said these architectures, could you give us some use cases like which are used for object detection, segmentation, or post-estimation of 3D SLAM respectively? What work are you focusing on? Do you use GAN, uh, GANs or uh, diffusion models or VA? Uh, computer vision is converging with NLP. What are your thoughts about text to video and generative models? So a lot of questions from one person. Maybe you can address some, of, some, some from that. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, uh, so model optimization, uh, model selection, this architecture development, really efficient for um, simple tasks like image classification, uh, even for object detection. Uh, but for such tasks as a generative art, for example, like generational models, these tasks are very sensitive to your architecture so when you will try to optimize your gun for example it's uh, really times harder than simple image classifier because in generative models when you remove at least one filter the results could be really a very different because all the stages depends on the previous ones um so i don't think i think the half of these techniques techniques will not work for some um, for some generation models, for example, because uh, some models really require a lot of computations and you could not really simplify them. Um, I think for optimization such of the models, there are some tricks of reparameterization, of um, quantization, for example, half precision, uh, maybe you could uh, optimize your uh, software or hardware, but for, su uh, for such a sensitive task, for example, uh, generation, um, for example, style gun three, I don't know, you, you can, uh, you can uh, replace some convolution pressure with something like a group mix net or um, micro net. Maybe it will work. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, some comments about fine tuning on device in supervised settings. It's challenging to provide supervision for streaming data. So it's rather common than a question. Mm. What, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, can you repeat this? <laughs> so uh, it the uh, that's a question from Renam Silva. So he said that uh, it's challenging to provide supervision for streaming data. Uh, so how do you find tune on device in uh, in supervised settings? I mean, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's question more about uh, training the model in each devices, and uh, you could not speed up training with selection of optimal architecture. Like optimization of training on OG devices, it's a question of um, software and hardware optimizations, not architecture, because your architecture is fixed. And when you train, you 
could only freeze some parameters to not waste your computations on them. So maybe, maybe you could optimize your training on device with freezing the most non-valuable parameters. For example, if you know that the that some part of your network did not produce really very valuable output and you can prune half of the parameters, maybe you should not include this part of the into the training parameters and you will save some computation resources. Okay, uh, thanks, Andre. Uh, next question, how non-model optimization using FPGA it can be useful and Im implemented for AI training on the edge. Uh, FPGA. F FPGA? Yeah. Oh, unfortunately, I don't know what is FPGA. Uh, yeah, FPGA, it's... Uh, how to say? I mean, I know what it is, but... <laughs> uh, programmable gate. Uh, I don't remember what this abbreviation means, but it's a kind of programmable uh, logic. So it's like... the somewhere in between ASICs and uh, uh, and uh, fixed uh, function accelerator. So it's like programmable, lo programmable logic. So, but anyway, you did, I assume you did not deal with that. So I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, next qu question is, uh, computer vision is converging with NLP. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah, I, I also see the strengths. So it's all because of the large language models, chat GPT, when uh, Jan LeCun said that, oh, people stop this language models is just a probabilistic models without real knowledge of the outside world. Um, so I think it's a question of the time, like uh, um, st stability, I created the stable diffusion, stable diffusion hyped for a few months and uh, now it's time for chat GPT maybe after the Microsoft uh, Square half of the open AI, maybe uh, the things will change. Um, yeah, but um, I think that uh, stable diffusion, for example, is more accessible for communities than uh, something models like chat GPT, for example, because large language models are very large. To inference a large NLP model, you need really a lot of resources. And that's why OpenAI provide only online interface. But for uh, generative art, you could really run st uh, stable diffusion on your uh, 3090 GPU. And I believe that uh, we will see a lot of interesting uh, use cases of the uh, generative art. But I think it will be a few uh with uh, large language models because it's less accessible for community okay thank you and probably the last question for today uh it's uh, so the question is tiny ml is using tiny ml generator uses tensorflow model if i'm not wrong can you please let me know how to use tiny ml generator uh, another tool for pytorch model again if you did not deal with tiny ml Tiny ML generator probably won't be able to respond, and I'm not sure that whether someone else can can help with that. Yeah, unfortunately, I I cannot help. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, some suggestions about papers if I want to train text to video in terms of avatar talking to you. Mm -hmm. Uh, look, take a look at the first order motion model and uh, the second version of it. Also take a look at some researches from uh, Adobe and NVIDIA. They are developing talking heads uh, with the text. Um, and it's mostly the task of lip sync when you have an uh, input signal of uh, audio or even text and you need to map this text into the human sleeps. So it's lip sync tasks, just Google it. Uh, there are a lot of uh, publications around it. And uh, I saw a lot of open source solutions for such tasks. Um, 
Okay, thank you very much. I think that we are we are done with the questions, and uh, now I need to go back to the presentation for a few yeah. more minutes. Um, and let me try. Mm -hmm. Yeah, seems like. Okay. I need to go back to the end of the presentation. And uh, uh, first of all, thanks everyone. Thanks everyone for joining. Thanks a lot for uh, asking all these questions. And of course, we really appreciate uh, tiny mouse strategic partners. Uh, and uh, big, big thanks for supporting the, the community. And uh, I would like to mention about our executive strategic partners. Uh, Edge Impulse, Qualcomm, Sintiant, our Platinum Strategic Partners, Deep Light, Krika Tech, Renesas, Sony, our Gold Strategic Partners, Analog Devices, ARM, Potterhub, Microsoft, NXP. Uh, Send CML, ST Microelectronics, Synoptics, and our silver strategic partners, Arduino, AIZIP, AON Devices, GreenWave Technologies, Groovit Incorporated, IBM, ImageMob, Itemeris, Nota AI, OctoML, Prophecy, Kixo, Rixen, SAP, Schneider Electric, Silicon Labs, Stream Analyze, TDK. Thanks a lot to all our partners. And once again, Big, big, big thanks for, to all participants. Big thanks to Andre, to our speaker. And we hope to see you again uh, during our up upcoming events. So thank you very much and have a very great day or evening or good night. Thank you very much. <laughs>